OK, it's a great setup. Hi, everyone. So uh, Nathan Harvey was supposed to give this talk. And unfortunately, he was uh, called away on family business. Um, if anyone knows Nathan, I know a lot of you do. Uh, you know, he would not miss this uh, lightly. So he is, gives, sends his regrets. He's not able to attend. But he did prepare this material. And I'm going to uh, present on his behalf. My name is Dave, and I work closely with Nathan at Google Cloud in our developer advocacy program. So today we're going to talk about using DevOps to become an elite performer. I'm going to show you the findings of a bunch of research that shows that there's a big range between how well teams are able to achieve the DevOps goals of throughput and reliability. And those differences have big implications for business results. Now the good news is we can all become elite. No matter your industry, no matter how big your company is, no matter how you got from where you were to where you are, you can get this done. You can be an elite performer. Or if you uh, prefer to be motivated by a little bit of drama, think of it this way. If you don't up your game for software delivery, you may be at risk of being outperformed, outcompeted by the companies that do. So DevOps Research and Assessment, or DORA, is a team of analysts who use academic methods to rigorously study how software is made and shipped. They focus on effectiveness at a team level, and they use statistical methods to determine causality, meaning what practices and capabilities are influential in driving successful teams. Something really awesome happened last year that Dora joined Google Cloud, and they've grown and expanded their work as part of our team. Now, Dora and Google Cloud recently uh, released the sixth annual Accelerate State of DevOps report. This just came out about two, three weeks ago, hot off the presses. Has anyone here read the report? OK. OK. Uh, that means everyone else is a not yet. And uh, this is really, I encourage you to really give this a look, because um, it's, a, it's a pretty quick read. It's uh, designed to be read by everyone from technical practitioners to CIO types. And we know how the CIOs like shiny colors and graphs that go up to the right preferably without you know, any uh, numbers or, or anchor in reality. So it's pretty easy to read. Um, and even if you only read a couple pages of it, you'll find uh, it interesting. And one of the things that's great about what's in this report, which I'll get into a lot of the details, but one of the things that, that you, is valuable is it helps you speak to other people in your organization. So something I hear when I talk to folks about DevOps is uh, they'll say, yeah, I'm sold, but I can't get any buy-in from anyone else. This is a, a problem that we all face. And this report will help you potentially advocate internally to folks to say, this matters. This is worth investing in. So this report's been running since 2014 with Dr. Nicole Forsgren as the lead researcher. It represents six years of research and data from 31,000 professionals worldwide. Did anyone here participate in the survey? We have one. We have two. Thank you for your data. Uh, those of you who didn't, you will have a chance later on in this talk to do a live participation in our own little survey. You'll see, it's fun. It's, fun. it's, it's I mean, fun. This is the largest and longest running uh, research of its kind, which gives us an independent view into the practices and capabilities that drive high performing. So the report is always focused on these four key metrics. These are like the four golden DevOps metrics. And they're rapidly becoming a standard for measuring DevOps progress. The metrics reflect effective software development and deployment. And this year, we also added an investigation into service operation. We're going to dig in on six key takeaways from this year's report. Number one, DevOps is on a roll. Seriously, it's, we're 10 years into DevOps, we're six years into this report. And as uh, you know, the growth of this conference and others can attest, this thing is happening. So the report uses cluster analysis and finds that there are clearly identifiable groups of practitioners. These are archetypes of how teams perform. Last year was the first time that their analysis revealed this elite group. And these teams are way outperforming the pack. And they're continually revising our understanding of what's possible upward. This year, check it out, the elite performers have almost tripled. Also take a look that the proportion of low performers is down. So that reflects a continued shift in the industry as organizations continue to transform their technology the proportion of medium performers is up. So it's reasonable to say from these data that DevOps has crossed the chasm. This is happening. This is becoming an ongoing growth engine within our organizations. Key finding number two. This one is sort of the uh, no news is good news because the good news was already there. 
we see continued evidence that software speed, stability, and availability contribute to organizational performance, including profitability, productivity, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, retention, all of these things reinforce each other. Our highest performers are twice as likely to meet or exceed their organizational performance goals. So usually you can't have your cake and eat it too. But the data speaks and it says let them eat DevOps. It's kind of, you know, I think intuitive to expect that increasing your throughput is going to hurt your reliability, right? But for six years in a row, the data have said that we can have both. In fact, the research consistently shows that speed and stability are outcomes that actually enable and reinforce each other. Third, people are important all throughout the organization. High performers favor strategies that create community structures at both low and high levels in the organization, including communities of practice and proofs of concept, likely making them more sustainable and resilient to reorgs and product changes. And what we find is that the elite teams really are focusing on that communication, the, communica the community, the uh, colleagueship among the people in the organization who are driving this uh, transformation. And some of the uh, techniques that are used successfully are things like communities of practice, grassroots campaigns, a proof of concept as a template or a proof of concept as a seed. Uh, the details of what this means can be found in the report. But basically what it, what it suggests is that embedding the uh, concept into the practitioner life, into the, the workflow of people who are on the ground doing it, is really effective. Some things are not so effective. And so things like training centers or centers of excellence that, uh, while super well-intentioned, tend to pull the expertise out, isolate it somewhere else in the organization, or anything that's about treating DevOps as a as something to be uh, taught or something to be um, certified. You know, there's nothing wrong with, with learning DevOps through curriculum, but if we're not experiencing it and sharing it and iterating on it internally to our organization, we're probably not gonna make it stick. Um, and another thing that we know uh, is that a big bang approach, trying to say, you know, our 100,000 person organization, we're all DevOps from now on, it's probably not gonna work that well. Uh, just as DevOps is about continuously improving, we have to continuously iterate ourselves to a DevOps practice. Cloud. Cloud is a big factor. And while DevOps doesn't necessarily mean cloud, there's a real high correlation there. And so it's a good place to look to find the uh, abilities to unlock a DevOps transformation. Teams who are delivering fast and maintaining high availability are much more likely to be getting there with the help of cloud technologies. However, we need to be careful about what we mean when we say cloud. Cloud's just one little word. It matters how we use cloud. Because cloud's a slippery term in my experience. It's perfectly reasonable to say that Dropbox is a cloud provider. But that's not what we mean when we talk about cloud infrastructure for DevOps. But there is a simple definition, and the NIS team made one. They have a two-page definition that they came out with, and it's really con uh, concise. They say there are five characteristics of what cloud really is. On-demand self-service, broad network access, resource pooling, rapid elasticity, and measured service. The adoption or uh, uh, the implementation of these capabilities in organizations varies widely. And so a lot of folks are using cloud and that's awesome and I happen to like when people use cloud, but we want people to use cloud well and really get benefits. So to further clarify, it's not just that the highest performing teams are using cloud. The highest performing teams were 24 times as likely as low performers to meet all five of these criteria of cloud computing. Only 29% of respondents met all five characteristics of cloud computing. The good news is if you're already on cloud, you have access to these things. But the, the hard news is that there's probably work to be done to really unlock those capabilities. Because too many organizations think, well, I'm paying for cloud, I've got a cloud bill, therefore I must be doing cloud, and yet they're not seeing results. It's like purchasing a gym membership. That's only the first step as my body can attest. You have to actually go. 
Are you actually taking advantage of these five cloud characteristics? And if not, you may end up getting up no value or even being worse off than before starting the cloud. There are key benefits that the cloud can offer that are obviously uh, beneficial to what you're doing. So first is that fast auto scaling. This is my favorite part about the cloud, elasticity, that we only need to buy the infrastructure we need. We can scale it up and scale it down as necessary for our business. Cost visibility, and this is a hard change for the cloud for a lot of folks. You go from having this um, CapEx where you know what you're going to spend, but you don't know how you're using it, to flipping it around, you don't always know what you're going to spend, though there are ways to mitigate that, but you know exactly where it's going and whether it's giving you a benefit or not. And third, security. Now, we all, uh, we all kind of want security to be someone else's problem, right? But we also all know that we need to make it everyone's problem. It's all of us. There's no way to simply outsource security, which is why we have this term like DevSecOps. I think that happened when some security person looked at DevOps and said, hey, wait a sec. But while we can't simply make security someone else's problem, what we can do is, contain, is uh, you know, isolate it and, and, and make it, um, make it con contra constrained in the sense that if you have a cloud provider platform, you know that security of a certain kind is going to be isolated for that provider. And you are putting them on the hook to maintain security there. And they're probably darn good at it because it's not just a few people's business uh, data they have to secure, it's all of it. And uh, I would rather let someone else worry about patching all of the VMs than doing it myself. Who has heard the term psychological safety? It's okay, you, you, it's just a safe place to admit. Uh, this sounds like a kind of a gooey, squishy term, and it is, and it's a great term. Um, we did something at Google uh, years ago, uh, ran a, a study of which teams are more productive or more effective than others, more effective from a business perspective. And what we found that the most important characteristic of a highly performant team at delivering business value was the presence of psychological safety. Psychological safety means having the ability to express yourself, to take risks, to be vulnerable with your team so that your team can be a learning environment. The State of DevOps report finds the same thing, that so to support productivity, organizations need to foster a culture of psychological safety, also make smart investments in tooling, information search, and reducing technical debt through flexible, extensible, and viewable systems. So here's an example on the tooling side. The usefulness and ease of use of deployment tooling is highly correlated with successfully implementing continuous integration and continuous delivery, CICD. This makes sense, because the better our tools are suited to the work we do, the better we are able to do our work. This drives productivity, it also drives employee satisfaction and retention. Let's talk changes and how changes get made. Heavyweight change approvals, such as change approval boards, cabs, negatively impact speed and stability. Anyone here ever get hit by a cab? It really slows you down, right? Whereas having a clearly understand process for changes drives speed and stability, as well as reductions in burnout. But what about enterprise? Enterprise needs these, these controls, right? And unfortunately, what we found is that these heavyweight processes tend to drive enterprises to be lower performers on the state of DevOps report. What we find is the enterprise have worse performance on speed and stability metrics, so they're going to need to focus hard on that. Does that mean that big orgs are doomed? No. There are strategies to help anyone, especially large organizations, improve. Things like what automation and process improvements should be tackled at the organization level for maximum impact versus the team level, and everyone can work together. So something you'll find in the report is a lot of practical tactics for how to implement and scale DevOps in your organization. No matter how big your organization is, it can be done. So, how do we apply this research to the work our team is doing? Well, one thing we know for sure, we can't make measurable improvements if we don't take any measurements. We need to know where we're starting from. And for that, we have what's called a DevOps quick check. So, let's take a look. We are going to launch the DevOps quick check. And we're going to go through this together. So I just clicked over to google.cloud.com, no, no, cloud.google.com slash DevOps. This is a newly launched. We launched this alongside the State of DevOps report this year. 
We've got a ton of resources. I'm going to zoom in because I can't see it up here, and that means you probably can't see it. Oh, and you won't see this. That's an internal tool. Okay, so what you'll see here is a definition of DevOps. There's a cute little video. This is adorable, um, which is about um, kind of just high level of what this report does and what's going on there. Then, perhaps you feel like I'm a broken record. That's on purpose. You can download this report. Go check it out. It's free. And then, as I mentioned, the DevOps Quick Check. So right now, welcome everyone here. You're all part of a new company called Columba Tech. And we are a Fortune 500 company, and we are going to find out how we're doing on DevOps. Let's take the quick check. Here we go. So the first question related to these key Dora metrics is lead time. And the question is, how long does it take from the time that a commit is made to a repo until it's actually live in prod and a user can make use of it. And interpret live in prod as whatever's appropriate for your kind of software. So who here uh, has the, that it takes more than six months for a commit to land in prod? Maybe you have a yearly research circle? No, no one? Okay. How about one month to six months? Okay. One week to one month? That looks like a lot. One day to one week? A lot there too. Less than one day. Yeah, we have a few. But what about less than one hour? There's a pocket over, over here. Over here are the fast people. All right, let's go with uh, one week to one month. Sounds about uh, where we're at. All right, next. How often do you deploy? The highest performing, uh, uh, highest performing teams deploy a lot. And remember, no judgments here. The whole point here is that we all want to find out where we are and improve. So how often are we deploying? Is it fewer than once every six months? Who's got a yearly or nine month deploy cycle? Cool. It's always good when I see you know, people sitting next to each other who probably work together answering the same. That means at least they know where they're at. All right, how about between one month and every six months? Like a monthly release cycle, quarterly? Couple. Between once per week and once per month? That's a lot, yep. Between once per day and once per week? Okay, okay. So not a lot of people on a weekly release cycle. Uh, between once per hour and once per day. Uh, we're getting pretty fast here. What about on demand, multiple deploys per day? You know, the, uh, the uh, what was it, uh, that photo site that it, it launched this whole DevOps thing. Cool, all right, it sounds like uh, once, once a week to once a month is about where most people are. All right, MTTR, folks know that phrase, mean time to restore. It means when there's a problem, and let's be honest, there will be problems. How long does it take to get from services impact, oh crap, to it's okay, everyone relax and go back to, to playing Roblox? Is that more than six months? It's real, it happens. What about one to six months? Okay, this is, this is, a, this is a, a web crowd, it seems, or a, I know there's a lot of retail folks here, you're not, probably not gonna, can't tolerate that. Uh, one week to one month? One day to one week, couple, less than one day, less than one hour, yeah. Okay, so we'll go with less than one day to restore from a serious impact. And then how much do those, how often do those deployments fail? So we've got zero to 15% of all deployments require remediation. It's actually not backward. You know what, I'm gonna start over from the backwards place. 76 to 100% of deployments require remediation. I have seen people say yes to this. We had a big hug, and then I said, go, you got to fix something. <laughs> 61 to 75%. How about 46 to 60%? About half of deployments require remediation. 31 to 45%? I know this gets a little particular, but good. Okay, we have someone who thinks there. 16 to 30%? And zero to 15%. Okay, most folks are in that zone. Oop. Okay, and then finally, one last question. So you can see this is a quick survey. What is our industry? So here at, what did we call us? Columba Tech. What industry are we in? Someone shout out your industry. Finance seems either the most common 
or the loudest, which is actually kind of my suspicion. All right, let's see how we're doing. So everyone obviously can go and run this report, run this test for your own uh, business. You can run it on your mobile phone. And what we'll see is that over here, things to the right are generally better, more of what we're looking for. So what we can see here is that we are kind of on par. We actually did pretty good on these bottom two, which are about our recovery stat. So it seems like we have good kind of stability, but our throughput is maybe lagging a little behind the industry. Uh, oh, actually, this is the overall, my bad. But same deal. We're lagging a little behind the industry, um, and you know, we, we, we probably would benefit from catching up or benefit even more from outperforming those. So what do we do about that? Well, you will find, after a lot more breakdown, you will find here on cloud.google.com slash DevOps, this is now an ongoing, evolving asset of information from the Dora folks. And what the, the Dora folks have found, and they've found this for several years now, is that there are a set of capabilities, capabilities that define who can uh, achieve, who, who, who correlates with who's achieving these high-performing uh, DevOps results. Um, and the more of these capabilities you are mastering, the better you're likely to do. So, um, and what you'll find on this site is a, a detailed uh, article written on each of, these, um, each of these capabilities. These are provided by folks uh, in the DevOps uh, community at Google and in the Dora report. A lot of this content was curated by Jez Humble, who uh, invent, wrote the book on continuous delivery. And of course, Nicole Forsgren has uh, done a ton of curation here to make these really important uh, articles. So who here does version control? Yeah. We've all done that one, right? Continuous integration. I was in a great uh, breakout session yesterday where we learned that there's a big variety of folks whether they're doing continuous integration or not. Now, it's pretty clear from uh, the analysis here that continuous integration is a good thing and is going to be probably good for the business. And in fact, we show that causative effect. Folks who do continuous integration, folks who do continuous delivery are more likely to have high performing DevOps teams. Deployment automation, trunk based development. It's another thing that uh, can vary a lot. Um, to typical practice is going to be to people to develop on long lived feature branches. What we've found is that that is unfortunately correlated with less high performance. It's better to be constantly merging back into master. Test automation, architecture. Well, everyone has an architecture, but this describes a bit of what good architecture could be. And so you can see if you click on any of these, you pop in and you get an article that has a lot of detail here uh, on how to make improvements on, and how to measure your improvements. So one of the things that I, is always a, you know, a question about these, this DevOps report is, okay, but how do I do that? You know, what do I go back and do today? And you'll find that all of these articles say, how, how oh, that wasn't how, how, there we go, how, how to do it. Um, and here's a bunch of uh, information that you can use to take back to your organization. All right, let's uh, flip back to here. So, once again, you can find the report, you can find that quick check analysis, and you can find all those great articles at this website. So, again, how do we take that information and bring that back into our organization? There are so many changes, there's so much to do. Well, one thing article you'll find uh, is something called DevOps Culture, How to Transform. And this is also reflected deeply in the report this year. So for folks who have read the report before, do read it again. Uh, the new one has some uh, really great new content, and one of the great pieces it has is very practical advice for how do I get from here to there. And once you've identified constraints, we need to apply a continuous improvement uh, approach to it. So folks here may be familiar with the Kata model. This comes out of Toyota, and their process for you know, pulling the cord and uh, analyzing what's happening and doing better every time. So the first thing to do is identify your key bottleneck. And uh, you know, you'll find this in lean manufacturing, you'll find this in the Phoenix project, right? If you're not addressing the single core bottleneck of what is hurting your velocity or stability, nothing else matters. Find that bottleneck, find the capability that you need to improve on, and set a goal, a reasonable goal, make it happen, iterate, and rinse and repeat. Finally, once again, download the report. If you don't like typing, you can scan this QR code 
and you can grab that report. You can do your own quick check, compare your results, see how you're doing. You know, it's perfectly fine if you do a quick check, don't tell anyone, go make a bunch of improvements and then do your next quick check and you say, look, look, I'm doing great. But whatever that is, it's probably not going to be enough for the future. So get started, get iterating, and, and please you know, give us feedback. Tell us if this information is valuable to you, how you're using it, what techniques uh, are, you're finding valuable, how you're able to promote these ideas within your organization. Thank you. Yeah, I said earlier that I'm doing my job if I just stand here and put this logo up. So, uh, I don't know where we are on the time. Do we have? We're actually a little short. So, questions? if we want to do questions, we can do questions. All right. Any anybody have any questions? Raise your hand. I'll come to you. Questions, success stories, failure stories. The report for 2019 showed that there were growth in uh, elite level performers, but the percentage of high level performers went down. Can you expand on that? I think, you know, obviously the high level performers, some of them uh, moved to elite. Hooray. Um, I don't believe the correlations are done across time because I I, I, my understanding of the report methodology, it's not like we can track individual folks so that we instead it's aggregate. So uh, the, the, the researchers have believed that some of them have moved up to elite, which is great. Some of them may have fallen back to medium. Either they weren't able to sustain some of their changes, and that speaks a bit to that culture of communication and community about creating sustainable practice. And also, this, the standards have gotten higher. You know, everyone is up their game. So if you were a high performer, you might not be anymore. I, so if I have the, the question right, it's can a high-performing team be globally distributed as opposed yeah, to co right, right. Yeah. So that's a hard one. Um, and maintaining a good distributed team is hard. There is, the, the report speaks to some of this, which says that um, it's more about culture, uh, communication styles. It's more about how you set team, uh, uh, objectives. So you absolutely can be a high-performing team uh, distributed. What is essential is to have a team be cross-discipline, multidiscipline. A team has autonomy uh, to develop their product, so a product team as opposed to a project team. Um, and one thing that uh, the Soder folks, uh, uh, the Dora folks in their Soder report do find is that functional outsourcing is negatively correlated with performance. So you can have you know, your QA person live on a different continent. What you can't really have, if you want to do really well, is say, QA is someone else's problem. We hired a company, and we just throw it over the wall to them. Yeah, question on what worked and what didn't work. Um, can you elaborate, give maybe some examples of what did work, and go a little bit deeper into, um, what, again, what didn't work and then what did work, and particularly the grassroots movement and community of practice, just what that looked like? Right, yeah. So. One thing that we see uh, in successful uh, transformations a lot is that you know, it, it always starts with someone or some ones who are excited about doing this and, and see the benefits and want to make it happen. Um, it works if you have a group of people who um, are embedded in their teams. You know, usually if it's someone who's, you, know, you have a, a sysadmin in one team and a developer in another team, and they're coming together to share information to um, bring their findings to each other and bring the findings from each other back to their teams. So these folks are embedded in those product teams and working for those product teams. What doesn't tend to work so well, what we've seen in some organizations, is they'll hire in a bunch of DevOps and kind of put them in a room somewhere and say, all right, you're the DevOps team. Go be excellent. And they, you know, they develop a bunch of best practices and they create a huge confluence wiki and whatever, and it doesn't just percolate out because they're not engaged with folks. Now that said, uh, something that does uh, work really well is exchange programs. So uh, something that people do, as we mentioned, is that you, know, you can't do everyone at once. So take a product team and engage them, empower them to do a DevOps transformation. And then have a couple of them switch with someone from a different team. And they'll both learn from each other. 
or have that, you know, um, that organization, the, you know, some folks have like a, a DevOps transformation team. Cool. But that DevOps transformation team can't just, you know, sit in an office somewhere and not talk to anyone. They have to go out and maybe they do rotations into teams or whatever. Um, the whole point being that you have to transform the people who, the, the work of the people who are doing the work, you can't stitch it on externally. Yeah, I have a little um, confusion, I guess. When we talk cloud, to me, that means like you're hosted somewhere else, right? That can you have a successful DevOps team in house using your own corporate servers and the like? I, hey, still, uh, cloud is just someone else's computer, right? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, and in fact, uh, from this, uh, the per per perspective of this analysis, my understanding uh, is that it doesn't matter whether the cloud is the public cloud or a private cloud. What matters is that we have those capabilities of users can self-provision their infrastructure rather than some long provisioning process with forklifts. Uh, you have that elasticity so they can burst up when they need it. Um, and, and those other capabilities which can absolutely be created on an in-house platform or in a multi-cloud or hybrid platform. Uh, hello. Could you give me an example on uh, a success story of DevOps in a data warehouse space? How does that work when it is a source of reference system and you're just depending on data coming in from the source of record? Oh, the database. That's always the hard part, right? Uh, so, um, you know, I, the success stories I've heard in there, a lot of it is about the, to be, to be honest, is more about the um, analysis and using of that data side, where uh, whatever tools you are using, to, whether it's ML or BI, whatever, iterating quickly on that and rapidly releasing your, your new models or new analysis tools, we can have a lot of that. The data warehouse itself is kind of still a hard problem. I would say, and, 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 and you know, my hunch is kind of resistant to a lot of these kinds of changes. That said, we heard you know, a great talk yesterday about uh, the uh, you know, kind of DevOps from a, data, a, sysadmin, a database administrator's perspective and how we could take these heavyweight systems that seem really hard to deal with and, and bit by bit kind of incrementally make them um, more like infrastructure as code, make them more like uh, immutable deploys and things like that. So I think it can be done. I think um, you won't see a ton of literature yet about transforming that. Uh, I hope you'll write it. Big hand for Dave. <laughs> 